Hello, everyone, and welcome to Dine Around Downtown Cooking at Home Edition. This is our fifth season, and we are excited that you can join us today as we kick off another three episode series. Uh, if you are new to the program and have not seen any of our previous episodes, uh, you would, and if you like to, you can check them out on our website at downtowny slash dine around, and you can find all the previous episodes there. Uh, my name is Ron Dijon, and I am the event manager at the Downtown Alliance, which is the business improvement district for Lower Manhattan. We strive to help make downtown a cleaner, safer, and more vibrant place to work, live, and visit. And one of the ways we do that is by providing support to local businesses. Dine Around Downtown Cooking Home Edition has been part of our continuing efforts to provide support for businesses, in, in this case, local restaurants that have been affected by um, COVID-19. Now, uh, today, the uh, food security charity that our uh, participating restaurant uh, tonight has chosen to support is the Heart of Dinner. And uh, to learn more about this organization and how to donate to them, uh, you can go to the heartofdinner.org uh, for your convenience. I provided that in the chat box, so you'll see that in the box below. Okay, um, now just a few housekeeping items that we need to go over before we actually get started. Um, we wanted to let you know that uh, this is being recorded, this cooking demo, so uh, it can be sent to all of you or will be sent to all of you who signed up, uh, whether you're here or not, but it will be sent to you tomorrow via email. Um, and during this demo, if you have any questions, uh, we are having all questions go through the Q&A feature. So you can find that uh, that should be, if you're using a desktop or laptop, usually at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you have a mobile device or uh, are using a tablet, a phone or a tablet, uh, you'll find that if you tap your screen once and it should appear either on the top right or the bottom of the screen, depending on which device you're using. So just go ahead and tap that screen and you'll see the Q box. So just enter your questions there and your host and uh, our chef will answer what they can during the demo uh, when there's time. Um, the chat box, however, we will reserve for us to share helpful links uh, to you guys while you're watching the demo. And uh, we're talking about things like this post your plate contest. Uh, if you're cooking along at home either today or over the weekend and uh, you have the recipe pages, uh, you can win. You can have a chance to win a 30 minute private virtual cooking class with tonight's guest chef by simply posting your plate on Instagram using the hashtag Dine around at home and tagging at downtown NYC. Uh, check out that link I sent, I put in the chat box and you can follow the directions and make sure you tag everyone because we want to see these photos and uh, you can win, win your chance to cook with a chef. Okay. Uh, okay, great. Uh, so what else do I have on my list? I think that's it. Um, let's see. Yep, there's your post your plate contest. You'll see it pop up on your screen. So don't forget to tag those. Uh, tag Rocco too, who's our host. Uh, and uh, he'll love to see your, your photos as well. Um, okay, so I think that's it for me. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and get the race started. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce your host, James Beard, award-winning chef and New York Times best-selling author, Mr. Rocco Bisbeardo. Hello, everybody. How are you? It's Rocco, and I'm so thrilled to be back for the premiere episode of season five of Dine Around Downtown, Cooking at Home Edition. You know the drill. We're going to cook along with one of the great chefs of Lower Manhattan. Uh, tonight we have someone, uh, you know, extremely special, like always. The uh, the producers, the behind the scenes people like Craig and Shelly and Ron do a great job of finding um, people that uh, are working hard, toiling away in their kitchens in downtown Manhattan. And uh, hopefully you'll get, uh, this will be you know, a reason to go visit them. I don't know if you guys realize this, but, you know, as chefs, the minute you you know how to cook, your next job is to teach everybody how to cook. So it's not unusual for chefs like our chef today and chefs like me to spend a lot of time teaching people how to cook. We love teaching people how to cook because that's how we pass on what we do. That's how we make our cuisine live on forever. Uh, and I love that you guys join us and that we've got, we've had such a great response uh, and I also get messages from you proving that you do, in fact, cook some of these recipes. Uh, and, and that's really encouraging and really exciting. Uh, let me introduce our chef today. His name is 
Haigo Hai, and he is first generation uh, immigrant family from Arcadia, California. He grew up in Los Angeles, New Jersey, and Beijing. Haigo, are you there? Say hello to everyone. Hey, guys. Hey, what's up, Haigo? How are you? Hey, thanks, Rocco, for the warm introduction. My name is oh, Haigo. My, uh, my pleasure. Yeah, I'm the founder and CEO of a restaurant called China. We have two locations now, one in Jersey City, one in downtown Manhattan in the financial district. How is everyone it's amazing? Doing? What's what's it like creating a startup uh, food business in, uh, man, in 2020 New York City? It's tough, man. It's tough. We we opened our first store in 2019. Uh, everything was it was a blessing. This guy's really we we opened up. It was a line out the door, overnight success. But then COVID hit. You know, we already had a second store on their way. So for us, like you know, taking that pause and then really getting everything, our foundation together, it was it was super important. We spent the last 18 months reflecting, uh, really improving our recipe uh, here in this kitchen. You know, we've been doing a lot of R&D here. Uh, the, the vegan mapo tofu has been one of our proud creations recently. Uh, so thank you for giving me the opportunity to show everybody how to how to make it at home. Yeah, we're super excited. This is a dish that, you know, we probably most of us have heard from. It's a Szechuan uh, dish. Forgive me if I'm incorrect about that. But uh, Szechuan peppercorn, of course, is the main ingredient. And uh, it's not something any of us will make at home unless it's you know part of what we grew up with. So we're super excited to see you make it and how you make it special. And obviously, this is on the menu at China, uh, where you can walk in, order this, and eat this uh, right, out, right at the counter. Is that correct? Absolutely. Uh the way I'm going to show you how to make it today is going to look very simple. Uh, it's not to deter you from to go from going to our restaurants and try the at the stores, uh, but you could definitely make this at home. Uh, most of the ingredients you could get from a local Asian grocery store, uh, you know, or Chinatown if you uh, ever venture down that way. Uh, but yeah, like you said, you know, Sichuan peppercorn has been, uh, I, I would say it's almost been um, uh, normalized at, at all these Sichuan restaurants that are popping up in New York City. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very unique flavor. I think um, uh, you guys will like it. Yeah, it's actually available now in regular stores. You don't have to go down to Chinatown or use a specialty grocer anymore to get it. Um, it's pretty cool. People know, people know about it. And people know that it makes your tongue numb and that it gives uh, Sichuan food, Sichuan food. What's the proper pronunciation? There's so many spellings. Correct the record we call for it, us now. The, we say it in Mandarin, Sichuan. Sichuan. Okay, got it. And that's the S I C H U A N spelling. Yes, C I C I C H U A N. Yes. Very cool. Very cool. And by the way, China is at a hundred maiden lane, and it's a new fast casual concept. So this is uh, this is a place where you can drop in when you're on the go, grab a quick snack. Uh, you can also dine in if you like. They also deliver. There's takeout. Uh, I imagine you're on all the apps. DoorDash, Seamless. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a different conversation. Yeah, he it's says a, with a huge a party, truck. So. We, no yeah. need to get into that. I think everyone's heard more than enough about the restaurant's uh, troubles with, with uh, delivery apps. But uh, we could probably go to your website to order directly if you want. Is that Absolutely. Is that yeah, go into our website. You know, there will be a promo code at the end of this. Uh, you'll get 15% off in your first order. Oh, it was 100% off in, in rehearsals. 15 now? <laughs> I'm sure you want to uh, why don't we'll, we'll you get happen. started and I'll continue to interrupt you annoyingly for the next 45 minutes. I promise not to do it too much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's been a tough 18 months, but, you know, whatever it takes to get people in the door, right? For sure. For sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, the fact that 99 cents out of every dollar that we take in goes right back out the door shouldn't deter us or anyone. We do this. This is a labor of love, <laughs> I think. Right. This is a passion. Absolutely. You got you to gotta love it to be in it. Yeah. All right, so how are we, we going to do this? Where do we start? So, yeah, I'm going to start with the rice. Um, ah. Just like at all of our restaurants, it takes the longest to cook. Today, we're making the forbidden black rice. Ooh. This is what it looks like uncooked. Uh, so there's a quick story about uh, forbidden black rice. The reason it's called, it's called that is because it was so rare. Uh, you know, we're not really using mashing cups. The Chinese way is we eyeball it. We're making it for two people. So that's about, that's about enough. Um, so yeah, the story goes um, back in the ancient times, black rice was so rare, it's growing in Southeast Asia. And 
not a lot of people have access to it. So it was only reserved to the emperors and the royalties. Now, <laughs> nowadays, you can get a very delicious, healthy, and hearty black rice for just an extra dollar at both of our stores. And I think, in my opinion, that's a, that's a big, that's a really, really good uh, good choice to replace that uh, with regular rice. And chef, this is unpolished rice. Is that correct? Correct. This is a, a, a type of wild rice, actually, uh, naturally black, high in antioxidant and uh, high in fiber. So, just that's wanted cool. to show you guys real quick. When we make rice oh, uh, let's, let's in, get at the Asian let's household, we would do a finger method. So, if it hits your first knuckle then it's enough water, but right now it's not. So I know the recipe calls for two part water, one part rice, make sure you use cold water. Uh, so now if you can get a little closer. So it's that is knuckle. a great trick. So one knuckle with the pinky, that's enough water, but yep. otherwise the ratio is two to one? Two to one. But not for all rice, right? Just this rice. Yes, yeah, so, so for white rice and for brown rice, we usually do one and a half, one and a quarter, uh, but for black rice, we do uh, two to one. And uh, those, we're using a little pink salt. Time-tested, sacred, right? Thousands of years. Thousands of years. You can't go wrong with that. That's right. So yeah, we're putting this now into the rice cooker. You need to have one of these. Uh, this makes your life so much easier than cooking on one of the uh, little rice pots. Uh, so, so all we have to do now is to hit, well, this is actually the fancy one. This one actually shows say, you different kinds of rice. One. Most, most of my uh, friends who have these are, you know, they're $12 at Bed Bath & Beyond and they work great. I mean, that, that's the thing. Like, it's like a Mr. Coffee coffee cooker, you know, it's a, you know, you just push one button, it's going to make a nice sound and it'll be ready in 45 minutes. Very cool. Awesome. All right. So today we are going to uh, make two dishes. Uh, we're going to make the mapo tofu with uh, shiitake mushroom. And then we're going to make a sauteed uh, baby bok choy. Now in store, we actually steam our bok choy uh, to, to keep it more healthy and uh, to, to keep all the nutrients in. But at home, we tend to uh, just do a saute since it takes less time. Um, so so we're gonna start. Can I ask you to just to, to either debunk or demystify or myth bust the uh, endless debate about whether you wash your rice or not, don't wash your rice. It seems to me, there are lots of people on both sides, and this is a big discussion. And I noticed that you rinsed your rice. You didn't really wash it. So you did something sort of in between. So what's your, what's for your... us, we, yeah, so, so for us, the, the white rice, we actually do wash uh, quite a few times. We wash it three times, usually at a minimum, to get out, to get all the starch out of it. This way, like when you cook it, it's not going to stick all together. You're going to be able to tell the uh, rice grains one from, uh, uh, the rice grains from each other. Uh, with the black rice and the brown rice we have in store, uh, they are a little bit medium grain, uh, almost long grain. So like it's a, uh, uh, they're a lot less starchy, right? Okay. So wash it, rinsing it once or twice would be uh, more than enough. So we want the starch, but not so much that it leaches out of the rice and makes the water that holds it all together thick and, and sticky exactly. like a risotto. You want the kernels or the grains of rice to be separate, intact. And, and sticky on the inside, not on the outside. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Okay, got it. So if we didn't so, wash yeah. our rice, and for people at home who just don't want an extra step, what's the worst that could happen? I mean, it, you're still going to be able to eat it. It's just uh, you know, it's going to be a little bit more starchy than, uh, okay. than normal. You could, okay. uh, if you added too much water, it'll be more like a porridge than uh, than actual rice. Oh, now you're talking about rice porridge, which is one of my favorite subjects. <laughs> you, you happen to make congee at uh, at China? That's that's in development. We're thinking about it is, right? breakfast line. Um, yeah. Kanji would be a perfect addition to the uh, to a healthy Chinese breakfast. It, it looks easy, but I'm sure it's very complicated. Timing and uh, temperature. That's yeah. Uh, yeah you got to be precise about that. Thank you so much for clearing that up. Of course, yeah. So you know, to get into the main event uh, today, we're using a uh, silken tofu, a soft tofu. I'm sorry. Uh, silken tofu is a little bit harder to handle at home, but uh, soft tofu, firm tofu, whatever you use, uh, it'll be all right. Um, so yeah, there usually be a becoming... lot of questions about the tofu. So forgive the interruptions in advance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no worries. Whenever we talk about tofu, there are many, many questions about where it comes from, how it's made, what style, how firm. Uh, so you're using the softest tofu that they sell, which would be sort of squishy in your hand, right? And barely uh, holds its shape. 
Correct. So we're using uh, a version of the soft tofu that uh, that is very soft. Uh, it's uh, it doesn't really crumble, uh, but it, it does have a very fragile texture. Now there is a type of tofu that we use in the store. It's called silken tofu. Uh, they have a lot more smoother of a of a texture, and it's uh, it's almost like um, I'm trying to think of a a, a uh, uh, comparison when it comes to texture. I would say it's almost like a butter at room temperature, you know, it, it melts in your mouth. Uh, so, so that absorbs the flavor very easily and um, it's, it's super delicious. Uh, when, we, when we cook at home, obviously it's a little bit more difficult, especially uh, I'm not a professional chef, I'm, uh, I'm a home chef. So cooking with silk and tofu takes a little bit more technique, um, you know, so that you don't break the tofu. Got it, okay, cool. So uh, silk and tofu would be something that someone who's adventurous would use if you're feeling a little less, a uh, little uh, uh, more confident, maybe you would use a, a less firm or more firm. How does that work? And where would you buy so this? You, so yeah, it, if you go to any supermarket now, you should be able to have uh, see an aisle of uh, uh, tofu uh, selections. And uh, usually there are three kinds. There's the silk and the soft and the firm, right? So if you're more confident in your technique uh, when it comes to using a wok or using a, a ladle to, to uh, stir the dish, uh, I would say silk and tofu will have the best texture. Uh, that's in my personal opinion. Uh, I, I personally have a lot of friends that uh, prefer firm tofu uh, yeah. in their mapa tofu. But uh, at the end of the day, I think it comes down to personal preference. It's just that for us, we, we really prefer the uh, texture of the silk and tofu. It's good to know. Good to know that it comes down to per personal preference and it isn't a hard and fast rule because I think a lot of us are terrified by, by what we believe to be our rules in cooking. And you know, as much as chefs like us tell people, there are really no rules. You kind of get to riff all you want. Many people want, you know, very, very specific guidance. Now you say any any supermarket, but we're really focused on downtown. So what, what would be a, a great downtown uh, New York City store for the people who are watching who live in the neighborhood to go to? Uh, New York, maybe New York Mart on Mott Street or something like that? And forgive yeah, me so if like... that's not in the alliance, everybody. <laughs> 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 no, I'm sure they, they carry it. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's becoming a lot more common now since, yeah. uh, you know, a lot of the mainstream uh, restaurants are starting to offer a, a tofu dish on their, on their menu. Um, but we usually go to uh, a place in Chinatown called Deluxe Meat Market. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a new world. What's it called? Step in. Deluxe, Deluxe Meat, Market. Meat Market. Okay, cool. That yeah. sounds like a um, great, a great <laughs> hidden, hidden little secret place. It's actually really, really cool. Um, if you keep an open mind, the, the minute you walk in, it you feel like you're back in Hong Kong or something. It's uh, wow. they, wow. they, they really they've been there forever. Uh, we've been going there. Chefs really like to go there to shop because they they do carry really fresh ingredients. Beautiful. Thank you. Thanks for sharing all the secrets. <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, just don't make it too popular. I hear you. I, you hear that, guys? Don't tell everybody. All right. So uh -huh. another trick while, while we're on the subject of tofu, right? Uh, uh, when cooking with silk and tofu, another trick our, our chef actually taught me last night was uh, you want to actually boil it in boil it in salted water for like a quick 15 second, 30 second uh, hot bath. This way the, you lock in all the moisture, right? You, uh, the, the tofu firms up a little bit so they don't break as easily. Uh, but with soft tofu, we can skip that step. Okay, sounds good. You'll show us how to All do right. that. Cool. So, did you already do just, that, or are we gonna we gonna do yeah. that? Great. I think we're ready. Uh, we'll just start uh, by slicing it in the middle. I like it a little chunky, so I'm just doing one slice straight down the middle. All right, and then you're just cutting it into cubes. A nice cleaver always helps. And they're not expensive, right? These are among the they're less not. expensive. These are, yeah, so believe it or not, this is only $15. Uh, wow. You get it in Chinatown as well. Uh, you just have to sharpen it. Um, the, another trick I learned yesterday was you could sharpen your cleaver on the back of a plate, just like this. Very cool. And that's like the no-throw way of going about it. Uh, and then just rinse it off with water, then you'll be all set. Yeah, super low maintenance. You don't have to like 
you know, going do anything crazy with it. So now the tofu is prepped. Uh, we're gonna start prepping some uh, some uh, bok choy so that we can have everything ready once the heat is on. All right. So tofu is ready. Um, with bok choy, these are the baby bok choy we get straight from the farms. Actually, this is the last. Uh, this is the last week that we can get these straight from uh, New Jersey farms because the temperature is dropping quite a bit. To prep them, it's very easy. We usually peel out the uh, first couple of leaves, and then we just uh, either half or cut them into uh, fourths, depending on how how you want the uh, the biceps to be. Now. The outer leaves are the ones that uh, the people really like to eat. The uh, inners, um, well, the inside is actually the uh, hidden treasure. A lot of people avoid them, um, but the texture of the root, um, I think that that gives it a lot of crunch. And uh, that's what I really like about the bok choy. So we're just slicing it a little bit. And there are a few different types of Chinese broccoli out there now. I see there's the bok choy, gai choy, a, a few more right. choices. Would all of those work in this preparation? Absolutely. So I think Chinese vegetables is one of the uh, most unique uh, in, when it comes to cooking them. It's uh, very, uh, it's almost interchangeable, I would say. Um, mm -hmm. On our menu, we have a seasonal green. That's where we go crazy, right? Sometimes we introduce water spinach. We do yu choy sometimes. Um, mm. And then Chinese, Chinese broccoli would be a gai lan. That has been a pretty popular dish recently. Um, it's actually a little bit bitter, but once you get past that, the flavor that's uh, that comes out of the uh, uh, the guy line is is absolutely amazing. Is the water spinach the one with the hollow stem? Correct, the hollow vegetable. That is. I think really they call it a morning glory at uh, Thai yeah. restaurants. Very cool. Yeah, so we actually had that for a while. Uh, it was super popular. And uh, it just went out of season recently. Sourcing from uh, local farms is a lot more difficult than I thought uh, while we're on this subject. Um, we tend to source as local as possible. We want to get the freshest thing. We want to know exactly where our, our vegetables are coming from, right? So uh, a funny story was, not sure if we have time for this, Rocco, but um, I used to buy them from distributors, um, they, they're the ones that, that wholesale cases of vegetables to you, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I keep getting these like yellow and, and you know, wilted greens. And I'm like, this can't mm -hmm. be right. You know, there has to be a better way. People are growing these. So um, one day I decided to follow their truck. Um, oh boy. To make the long story <laughs> short, I ended up going to their wholesaler, right? These are people who receive uh, yeah. pallets upon pallets of, uh, of greens to their warehouse. And then I realized the warehouse is actually in Jersey by uh, closer to, to our restaurant versus the distributor who's in uh, who's based in Brooklyn. Now, uh, I reached out directly to the, to the warehouse and I said, hey, listen, can I just buy straight from you? We're so close to you. Can I go back up? All right. So yeah, basically, you know, um, they're like, yeah, yeah, of course. And then they were telling me, you know, vegetables would sit in their warehouse in the refrigerator for, you know, sometimes a week, maybe two weeks. Um, and I was like, wait, that, that's not fresh. Like that's not local. Um, so then I decided to follow their truck. And then I, I think I went, I followed him on the turnpike in New Jersey, all the way down to exit three. And that's about like a, you know, three hour drive all the way down South. Uh, and then I followed them into this little farm and I saw them loading up. Then I, I waited till, till the morning. I knocked on the door. I said, hey, listen, you know, I saw somebody come and pick up, uh, you know, vegetables from you. I own two restaurants. Can I please start, uh, you know, buying direct from you? How much are they paying me? Then I realized there's a huge discrepancy, right? The price difference between uh, what this uh, wholesalers pay the farmers versus what, you know, what they're actually, oh, versus what we're paying them. Uh, the, the price difference is quite a lot. And it's, uh, you know, adding a layer to, to the whole supply chain that makes it super difficult. Um, but anyway, that's, uh, that's how we got to know these amazing farmers and we get to get the freshest uh, produce from them. What, what you just described could be the plot for the next 007 movie. So I would be careful <laughs> who you tell the story to, uh, just in case yeah, your purveyors are listening. <laughs> yeah, so I don't want to get in, yeah, I don't want to step on anyone's toes, but they, <laughs> I'm sure they know this when you buy like 150 cases less every every quarter, you know, yeah. uh, every week, sorry. 
So to Very do, cool. I guess uh, we, I wanted to show you a little bit of the mise en place here, you know, the ingredients we have for today's uh, cooking. Um, can you bring the camera closer, please? So over here is everything we need to make the dish, right? We have a little bit of oil. This is the shiitake mushroom that we soaked and uh, diced. We have a little bit of sugar. We have some dried chili peppers and peppercorn in here. And then we have the doubanjiang. This is the fermented bean paste. We have a mix of dark and light soy sauce. This is a secret. This is what we call in the kitchen, the red oil. It's made with, uh, my chef <laughs> told me to not tell anyone, but this is like 25 different kinds of herbs uh, simmered in oil for like the overnight. Um, it's super fragrant. I wish you could smell it right now. Um, but this is really the soul of the dish. And then we have some uh, vegan mushroom sauce here. Uh, this is a mushroom oyster sauce. It doesn't have any oyster in it, but it has a lot of taste. Some um, uh, ginger, I'm sorry, some scallions for garnish. Uh, this is cornstarch with water. It's uh, used to thicken, uh, thicken the sauce. And then we have some uh, ginger. So you don't have to tell us what's in it, but all you have to do is sell it. Sell that oil to us so we can we can use it at home as well. <laughs> we're we're working on bottling them. <laughs> good. There are a lot of questions about vegan oyster sauce. What what you're using a mushroom sauce for vegan oyster sauce? A mushroom yeah, base? So, so yeah, these are now uh, available at supermarkets where uh, oyster sauce is, uh, well, to, to begin with, oyster sauce is a very traditional seasoning uh, sauce in Chinese cooking. Um, it's required in most of uh, most Cantonese dishes. Now, uh, there are a lot of people who have dietary restrictions. So, so for them, uh, oysters is, uh, or, or allergies. So oyster is really off the table. Now, uh, mushrooms have a very mushrooms have a very similar uh umami flavor to you know to them so uh what what these uh, manufacturers decided to do was to to use it in replacement of uh of oyster of actual oysters and uh the flavor is actually very very similar and it's completely vegan and not gmo great to know thank you so much a lot of people ask the question uh ava is a uh, frequent guest and uh she wanted to see your address again. It's 100 Maiden Lane, uh, downtown Manhattan. And there's also one in New Jersey. Um, and the name of the purveyor that uh, they just called and they wanted you to know that they were, I'm just kidding, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> you not, got not there for a second. Kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but Angelique wanted to know if you press the water out of the tofu. I've seen people do that. And I'm wondering about it myself. Is there any reason to press the tofu? So yes, you want it to be as dry as possible. This way, when it hits the pan, it doesn't splash. Uh, we already pre-treated the tofu. Uh, that's just, I, I guess I should have showed you that uh, earlier. So you basically uh, drain, they come in little boxes and uh, uh, there's water in it, right? So you want to drain the water first and then you want to lay the tofu on a, on a layer of uh, paper towel. Then you want to pat it dry. And uh, some people press it uh, with a heavy object on top. Um, but that's usually when you want to grid, uh, put it on a griddle and do like a, a, a pan fried tofu dish. For us, I think we we're trying to keep some moisture in it so that it's a little bit more uh, juicier when you cook it. All right, sounds good. That answers All the right, question. so much. I have I have some hot water here with uh, salt in it. Uh, we're going to use that to blanch the bok choy. So I'm going to turn the heat on for now, uh, and then we're going to get started on tofu in the meantime. Okay. So the, the key to making mapo tofu with mushrooms is to make sure to get the flavor out of it, uh, out of all the herbs that you have. So we're, we're going to heat a pan up a little bit. Right now we're just on high heat. I'm going to turn the fan up just a little bit more. Can you still hear me all right, Rocco? I can hear you, and I, I wanted to confirm that you were using high heat all the time. In, in the restaurant, you would use a wok, right, which would be something in the 100,000 yes. CPU range. Yes, so so restaurant cooking is a lot different than home cooking. Uh, in the restaurant, if you leave the, the wok on for like five seconds in high heat, it's going to be burnt already. Um, but here, you know, it takes a little longer. Uh, as soon as you start to feel the heat, you can drop the oil in. We're not using too much. Uh, just enough to get the, uh, uh, the the fragrance out of the spices. So I'm gonna cool the bottom of it. 
All right. Once it gets a little bit warmer, I just want you uh, dropping the spices. Would you be okay cooking this in a cast iron pan for, for those who have, you know, sort of uh, underperforming home, home stoves? This is actually a dish I would cook during camping. Um, so oh, we've wow. actually done this. Yeah. It's, it's, it's super fun, you know, like camping food can be boring. It's usually steak. I love steak, but you know, it's, it's kind of boring when you don't have flavor. Uh, so at some Chinese restaurant, I mean, some, some Chinese supermarkets they actually sell prepackaged mapo tofu sauce, which is something we may eventually get into uh, a China branded uh, spice pack. Um, but you know, it's, uh, it's uh, it definitely brings a lot more fun to to the party. And uh, to answer your question, absolutely, you can use uh, you can use a cast iron pan. Like today, where I'm using a regular saute pan. Um, yeah, it doesn't really uh, make too much of a difference for this specific dish. So right now, in here, I have minced ginger, I have uh, dried chili pepper, and peppercorn. Just wanted to make sure you get the fragrance out of it. I'm going to turn it down to a medium heat and let it cook for just about a minute or two. All right, so at this point, you're probably, it's it looks like it's three to five ingredients. You're waiting for the fragrance of the ingredients to hit your nose, and that's how you know to continue. Is that right? Correct. You can actually smell it already. Um, it's only been like around 30 seconds. Um, as soon as you see the ginger to, to turn a little bit brown, right? And you could almost tell by just the smell of it. Got it. That's when you want to add the uh, mushrooms in. So Got it. again, we're using the uh, rehydrated dried uh, shiitake mushrooms and some fresh thing here. Uh, dye stuff, and then we're just adding that in. This is in replacement of the uh, meat, uh, according to the traditional recipe, if you will. Uh, traditional you recipe calls for uh, ground beef. Ground beef, okay, got it. Uh, but one can use any protein dye stuff to, uh, to give it more uh, flavor. In college, I had, <laughs> in college, my favorite way to make uh, mapo tofu was actually with bacon. So uh, th this is a lot of people are going to get mad at me for saying this, but um, bacon gives it such a unique uh, smoky flavor, uh, which I think mapo tofu really needs. Um, shiitake mushroom does a, a very similar thing, especially when you use some of the dried mushroom. Um, but bacon is actually a very good substitute for the mushrooms as well. If you want to uh, do a meat version and you don't have ground beef around. Couldn't agree more. Bacon is usually a great substitute for anything, unless, of course, you're vegan or vegetarian. So, so you have about <laughs> half the ingredients in the pan right now. It's simmering now at medium heat. Would you call this sauteing or simmering? Uh, I would call it simmering a little bit, you know. Okay. I don't have a lot of oil in it right now because okay. uh, we're not making a huge quantity. But right now, we're just trying to get the mushrooms to uh, to dry up a little bit to absorb right. some of that fragrance. Mm -hmm. uh, the next thing that will go in is the doubanjian, that is the uh, fermented bean paste. So we're doing about two tablespoons today. Of a small teaspoon here. A little bit more. All right, so you really have to cook the bean paste a little bit um, before you add anything else because um, they have a, a little bit of a bitter taste to it if you don't cook it all. Um, so right now we're just trying to get the, uh, get everything to mix together. And this will be the base of our mapo sauce. You can see some of that redness is coming out of the fermented bean paste. Got it. So we're letting all that sort of saute simmer together. These are um, basically condiments at this point, right? So their their flavors are already developed. You don't really need to spend a lot of time on on the on the the stove. 
No, no, not at all. So we're gonna add just a little bit of the red oil to enhance the flavor. And the rice, of course, you never need to check. The worst thing you can do is open the rice cooker. Oh yeah, cooking, please right? don't. You've got to, you've uh, got to wait everything. for that light to go off. Is that right? Hundred percent. It's gonna it's gonna make a sound, and uh, you'll know it's ready. All right, the water is boiling for the uh, bakshi. I'm just gonna add the bakshi in. And it's important to cook the bok choy before, right? If you put it directly into the pan, I don't think you'd get the same texture. It's not going to cook properly. Right. Yeah. So we, this is what we call blanching. It's uh, yeah. actually a very simple technique, salted water. Um, hold on, I'm just going to grab a pair of pans. I think few people get vegetable cooking right like the Chinese chefs do. Uh, any, any veggies I get from anywhere in Chinatown are usually perfectly cooked and glazed and just tender enough, not overcooked. It's amazing. It's a very consistent skill. Like why eat salad when you can't eat something delicious? Just kidding. <laughs> All no, right, so I the base is getting you. there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then we're gonna just add a tad bit of soy sauce into this now. Okay. You don't wanna add the soy sauce too early because uh, otherwise it's gonna get burnt and it's gonna give off a bitter taste. Once the soy sauce goes in, we're gonna add two cups of water. So now that becomes the, this becomes the sauce. Uh, so darker Beautiful. than I like. Wow, look at that. Look at that. All right. So the color so eyeballing from all that oil and all the spices, it's gonna have a beautiful bright red color. Absolutely. I just added the, a little too much dark soy sauce. So I wanted to uh, balance it out with a little bit more red oil. Okay. I saw that the or soy sauce was pretty there. thick. Looked like special secrets, you know, chef stash <laughs> stuff. So, so correct. So the uh, fermented bean paste, the soy sauce, and the red oil that we're using today, these are all made in-house uh, at our kitchen. Wow. Um, wow, we wow, make wow. them in big batches. We add like, you know, different herbs to it. So it has a very nice smell to it. Um, but you could simply replace it with something store bought. It's going to have a very good taste to it. Uh, you can't go wrong with it. They so sell yeah, this secret just... stash soy sauce now. It's just much more expensive. So I think a lot of people are afraid <laughs> or don't understand if it's worth it or not. I can tell you from experience that it's definitely worth it. There are many, many 100%. levels of soy sauce. And the good stuff is, you know, has more hours put into it and aged longer and def definitely tastes better. Yeah. It's just like balsamic vinegar, you know, like you, people will pay, you know, like $40 for a little like six ounce, you know, container. Yeah. Um, Crazy but, stuff. you know, yeah, it's uh, I, I think every culture has its own unique um, uh, specialty. So the bakshi is pretty much done. I'm just going to take the lid off and take the bakshi out. Yeah, the, the leaves on top is still a little undercooked, but that's fine because the residual heat, uh, the residual heat is gonna continue to cook it, and we're still sauteing it later. So it's gonna and be it's fine. going right into the pan, right? You're not gonna shock and rest this. There's no need for that. Um, right. If you want extra crunchy, you could. I've seen people do it, but uh, personally, I prefer a little bit softer of uh, texture. So I'll just leave it right here all right so now this can stay on the side for now i'm going to dump the water and i'm using the same pan so we don't have to wash dishes later uh, home cooking i think the the key is really to to uh, let someone else clean let someone else clean that's one way to do <laughs> that's, it or just try not trick. to use too much <laughs> Listen, right. when you cook at home, you can always pull the I cooked, you clean. That's an internationally recognized rule. Everyone <laughs> understands it. And there's usually no debate. No, 100%. Um, that's actually the, the rule in the kitchen, too. You know, we, uh, our chefs and dishwashers, they have a very uh, uh, distinct responsibilities. So now we're putting tofu in right. a little bit of water. We don't want that water. So I'm going to 
dump that. Cool. And uh, tofu slides right in. Mm. Look at that. And gonna be so don't good. stir it too much. Uh, just let it cook. Uh, all you want to do is to make sure the uh, tofu is submerged in the sauce so it gets all of that flavor. Uh, but don't stir it too much, otherwise you'll break it. That's definitely good rule. Dark don't right stir now. it. Don't don't uh, disturb it. Don't mess let with it. Let it do its Just thing. Just leave it. Yep, let it do its thing. Um, and a lot of that sauce is going to be cooked off uh, in a little bit. So we're going to get started on the bok choy. I'm just going to slice uh, slice some garlic. Uh, you can mince it. You could uh, uh, you could just put a whole chunk in. But personally, I like slicing them. Uh, right, garlic is here. Um, I guess I can show you both ways. Uh, at the kitchen, we make it easy. We smash yes. it. Smash that girl. Uh, yeah, and then you just throw it yeah. in. It's you know, but for for me, I like a little. I like to bite into a little bit of garlic, so I would slice it very thin. Isn't there a, isn't there a saying that that goes something like "I'll smash you like ginger"? <laughs> so so yeah, ginger you can. <laughs> You can smash the ginger too. Um, You're wondering how I know that. I know. <laughs> All right. Um, so so yeah. Now I personally like to make uh, almost like a crispy garlic, right? So uh, once they're this thin, all you have to do is to turn on the heat, drop a little oil in. Once the the pot dries out, obviously, we'll do a little bit of oil. And sliced garlic can go in pretty soon because we're trying to get it to crisp up. And I'm um, gonna throw this in for measure. Um, so now you get two different uh, textures in there. You want that to be ripping hot, no? Uh, so for, for the bok choy, yes. For garlic, I'm just trying mm -hmm. to extract the flavor, so I'm actually yeah. not trying to, you know, get the oil too hot before I okay. put in the garlic. Otherwise, it's going to get burnt, especially when they're so uh, so thin. Mm -hmm. uh, one day we're going to start making our own crispy garlic too. Such you a satisfying. To Everybody's now. doing it. Crispy chili everywhere. Crispy chili oil. Oh yeah, chili crisp. Yep, it's delicious stuff. I always bought Actually, a bowl for five dollars from my favorite uh, kanji place on Mott Street, and they stopped selling sure. it. I, I guess it wasn't making them money, or it was too labor intensive. It was so good though. They were only selling it for five dollars. Takes twenty four hours to make. Hey, there you go. So yeah, I'd the pay tofu. More. I'd pay twenty. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I would pay twenty. All right. Unless you use organic chilies, huh? All right. So now we have the tofu. It's uh, simmering away. Um, just gonna leave it, you know, it's like if you see like white spots, just give it a quick flip so they all get the sauce. Um, again, in a wok, it's a little bit easier. You can just swirl it around, uh, but we're in a saute pan, so I'm just gonna leave it. And then here you're looking at the uh, garlic that's browned up. So now that's almost ready for the uh, bok choy to hit the pan. Just wanna coat the bottom of the saute pan. Actually, it goes right in. There's some water, so you want to be careful. And remember, we're on high heat, so this is going to be a very quick cooking process. If you have a wok, you could do the fancy uh, pots, but uh, today we're just doing a quick saute. Now look at that color. I mean, like when you get greens fresh, it's like everything just it's just so much easier, you know, like you don't have to worry about overcooking it too much. Um, you know, you don't have to season it as much. It's, it's got a natural, almost sweet flavor to it. So yeah, a quick saute. You're gonna get some uh, burn spots. That's what you're looking for. I'm 
the tofu is almost ready. Now we're adding the um, cornstarch with uh, mixed with water. All right, so this is a cornstarch water mix. Just give it a quick mix. Usually we use our hands, but uh, on camera, it's going to be a little bit uh, more respectful. There we go. Just adding the slurry in. Just want to add in where it's like super watery, this way it thickens up. Just a couple of tea uh, teaspoons. And then you want to give it a quick stir. So now you're stirring from the bottom. Just make sure to not break the tofu. Use a little bit more thickener. You can add a little bit more. And so for the, those of you who wonder why we do a slurry, it, it's because if the, the cornstarch was not uh, moistened by water to start with cold water, it would actually not work once you put it in the sauce. The, the, the hydrocolloidal gel that we're looking for that thickens the sauce wouldn't work. It's just the law of physics. So it has to be moistened with cold water first, and then you add that slurry to the pan. All right, the bok choy is ready. Thank you for the uh, explanation, Otto. That's actually precisely why, uh, you know, at like when I first started cooking, that's a, a big mistake I used to make. Um, and I think it's uh, it, like once the sauce thickens, it actually wraps around the tofu and, and, you know, every bite just becomes that much more flavorful. Uh, so once the uh, bok choy is ready, I just want to put it onto a nice dish, just like that. And the brown bits is what you're looking for. That's where the flavor is. The, I guess a wok, hey, you can call it, even though we didn't use a wok. Now, we can set this aside. It looks absolutely spectacular. Perfectly done. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Coming from you, that means a lot, Rocco. <laughs> thank you. All right. Let's, let's I've overcome plenty of vegetables. <laughs> All right. So now the tofu is ready. It's a little bit more difficult. Need a little bit more space. Oops. All right. Heat off. I use a little ladle here to make it easier for me. And get all of those uh, sauces and the mushrooms in there. So I'm making a serving for four people, but it's just the two of us eating today. We're just gonna leave a little bit left in the uh, in the sauteing pan. And to garnish, this is a sliced scallion. Uh, we put it in cold water so it curls up a little bit. All right. Beautiful. There we go. Nice scallion garnish. That took some time. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's actually quite easy. You just uh, slice them diagonally and then put them in cold uh, in cold water. Then it curls up. That's and, the pro uh, tip. The rice is not. Water. <laughs> yeah, that's the, the magic. All right, rice is almost ready. Um, all right. It. So now we're making a china bowl, right? So if you come to our restaurant, uh, it comes in a bowl like this, right? Can you show the bowl a little bit? All right, nice. so it's a bed of uh, cooked black rice, forbidden black Jeez, rice. Portion. And then, yes, yeah, so, so it's actually uh, quite larger than uh, our competitors, but just like our grandma used to say, you gotta, you gotta treat your guests well and feed them until they can't eat anymore. So now we're just doing a little bok choy. Lay it on the side. And then the tofu. 
I don't want to destroy this, so I'm going to use the one in the pan. And just like that, I'm ravenous for Mapu tofu. I knew it was going to look good. I didn't. I didn't realize it was going to make me salivate like this. And I, I'm getting comments to the same effect. Boy, does that look delicious! And this is a vegan dish, right? This is a vegan dish. Yeah. It's. Uh, you could almost taste the. Uh, uh, the mushrooms almost brings out a umami flavor that makes it. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, umami make bomb. you feel like you're eating meat. All right. So we'll wipe them. Okay, we're done. So yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much it. Um, you know, that's how you make mapo tofu. That's incredible. Congratulations! It looks amazing, everybody. Um, thank you, thank I, I think that's only six ninety five or something like that at at uh, China One Hundred Maiden Lane. Let's get to some questions. They want to know what's where we can buy or tell us a little bit more about the secret chili oil. Can you give us a couple of? Is there, for example, is there um, star anise in it? Absolutely. So there's ah, that. there you go. Um, <laughs> There's also bay leaf. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the ingredients, the herbs, the spices are actually quite common. Uh, okay. I don't actually have the full list in front of me, and it'll take me forever to memorize them. Good uh, answer. But... Good answer. <laughs> Do you have any cooked rice it, in front of you? Can we see what that looks like? It's actually not done yet. I just had some cooked rice from. Yeah, uh, let's from see. Let's see it. Batch. I think. I think we're. Uh... Okay, got it. It's underneath. Uh, understood. It's underneath. Cool, cool. Uh, the... Yeah. What's, yes, what one could you substitute the red oil longer. with? What's that? Kathy wants to know, what you, what could you substitute the red oil with if you can't get to you or can't of figure course, out yeah. how to make it? So, so give a shout out to, I'm giving a shout out to uh, Fly by Jing. Uh, they actually carry a product that's very similar to this. Uh, it's called the, uh, uh, I believe it's called the uh, Joan sauce. So you could go on their website and order it. They come in uh, in an organic can. It's, uh, it's really, really nice. Uh, and if you want to go uh, a little bit more um, low key, I guess, uh, you could get a, a chili crisp brand called uh, Lao Gama, L-A-O-G-A-N-M-A. -A. So that, that's where, uh, that's what most Chinese households actually have at their oh, homes. Wow. Okay, that's great. These um, are these are huge secrets that you're dropping here. Thank you very much. <laughs> this is usually protected course, information. Yeah. Thank you for asking. Well, I think it was Wena that asked. It, asked. No, Wena actually asked about a liquid that you added. Wena, that was the cor um, cornstarch slurry. That's what thickens correct. this dish and most dishes in quick saute Chinese cooking. And correct me if I'm wrong, please, Hegel. Um, no, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Jalik wants to know... Some of the spices we told her that it's uh it's a third she says it's a 13 hour drive to the nearest chinese restaurant in montreal it's, Quebec, and oh, she's wow. watching there so we got oh we got um chili out of him we got star anise we got bay leaf there's i'm gonna guess there's probably some black bean or something like that in there fermented black bean paste maybe maybe no? yeah maybe. maybe okay all right but you can just buy chili chris he gave you the brand and he gave you the website Fly by Jane. Those are you know guarded secrets. So those are very uh, very delicious. That, I appreciate it. He's going to be in trouble later. Uh, <laughs> and, he, and someone wants to know if it's Asian black rice or North American black rice. If so, what's the difference? So the one we use is actually called uh, black. Uh, uh, it's called Thai sweet rice. Uh, so it's it's grown in Thailand, obviously, but okay. it's it's got a lot more glutinous texture to it. So it's almost like a sticky rice uh, okay. when it comes to texture. Uh, but it's a lot more nuttier and sweeter when it comes to flavor. Uh, this is what we use to to make. Uh, I guess I'm here already. So we're 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 about to roll out the breakfast line, like we saw uh, we said before. Okay. Yeah. There's a dish called Fun Twine. So that's uh, that's when you use uh, glutinous rice uh, rolled in, uh, rolling the uh, the fried curls and the uh, rolled song, which is a dried pork floss, uh, into the into the rice roll and those are absolutely the delicious snacks where we're, we're developing it right now uh, using the uh, black sweet rice. And I think that's going to be a huge hit for, you know, for the breakfast commuters. And guys, I think the point here is that the forbidden rice has a lot more flavor. It's earthier. It's nuttier. If you can only get your hands on wild rice, for example, I'm sure that would work great. Uh, but you can get, you know, black rice on Amazon probably fly by Jing has black rice or forbidden rice. Uh, <laughs> Definitely, you, yeah. you want an unpolished natural rice. Would this work with red rice or some of the other unpolished darker rices? 
Uh, yeah, but again, you know, I think the when it comes to texture, we've tried many different varieties. Uh, okay. Thai sweet rice has been the one that's most consistent. It, it provides uh, that almost like a dessert, uh, you know, aftertaste. Amazing. Uh, Even yeah, Whole Foods nice. has forbidden rice. So it, Whole Foods has no excuses, too, guys, yes. you can get this stuff. Let's let's uh, Rob Assen, who's been uh, on before, just wants to confirm that soft tofu should be gooey, right? And uh, he doesn't, he wants to know if you're trying to make it dry, why don't you just use firmer tofu? He's sort of confused as to why we wouldn't want the pudding-like texture that soft tofu already has. And thank you for the no, talk, that's... Rob, I appreciate it. <laughs> Yeah, thank, thank you for the question. I think, it, it, again, it comes down to your personal preference when it comes to the three different types of tofus. Uh, again, a lot of people prefer firm tofu uh, for, for that very, very uh, reason. You know, it's drier, it's firmer. Uh, but the reason we're using soft tofu is just because it's a, it's a little bit closer to that pudding texture. We're not trying to dry it to, the, to a degree that it is uh, like a firm tofu. So that's why we didn't uh, put uh, any hard... Uh, so I'm sorry, any uh, heavy object on top of it just squeeze the, the water out. Oh, we did. I think, I think what everybody's that. trying to do is, is get to that, you know, perfect place between uh, not liquid and firm enough so that it has some bite to it. Uh, and I think soft tofu probably has a little more fat in it, in addition to water. Um, so Vicky wants to know if black peppercorns will work. I don't remember when you put the Szechuan peppercorn in. I'm, it might have been in the oil, but I, I might have missed it. But black peppercorns, in my opinion, work, but they're not the same. What do you think, Chef? They're not. So Szechuan peppercorn has a lot more of that numbing flavor yes. and fragrance to it. It's yeah. almost green before you cook it. Uh, black peppercorn would work just fine. Uh, it has less of less intense of a flavor profile. Uh, but again, you know, I think you could probably get your hands on uh, a citron peppercorn powder uh, at Asian grocery stores. And those, those work really well as well. Yeah, I mean, McCormick's has it now. It's in every spice line there is. <laughs> it's, it's no longer hard to get. It's amazing how much things have changed in, in the 20 years since I started you know, browsing Chinatown, trying to find secrets. Uh, Angelique says uh, she can see this recipe with a piece of pork filet cut into thin slices. I agree. Nicely browned Definitely. pork would be amazing. Cindy uh, F says she can smell it through the computer and any suggestions <laughs> for those on low sodium diets, um, tamari or low sodium soy sauce or cocoa, coconut aminos maybe. What, what do you think, Chef? So if you don't care so much about the uh, colors or the, the presentation of the dish, I think tamari would, be, would work just fine. Tamari is a little bit sweeter, uh, less salty, and uh, it's lighter in color. So you know, if you want your mapo tofu to, to be less dark, uh, that would be a good way to go if you want gluten-free or less sodium. Uh, but it, I think honestly speaking, there's not a lot of salt in here. We didn't add any salt into the into the recipe. So it's, uh, you know, I think it's already a, a fairly healthy dish. Amazing, thank you so much. The dish is even more beautiful than I expected. I'll be down there soon. As you know, I'm, I'm a resident of the neighborhood. To learn more about the Downtown Alliance, visit the link in the chat box. It's downtowny.com. Uh, don't forget that China has chosen Heart of Dinner as their food security charity. Please show your support and uh, go to Heart of Dinner. <laughs> my, my info box just disappeared, guys. That's why I'm laughing. Uh, go to heartofdinner.org, and, and I imagine there'll be plenty of information there. Uh, Heart of Dinner is a food security charity that's doing amazing work. They're all over the media. Uh, don't forget, post your plate. Participants are encouraged to whip up their version of the featured recipe and upload a photo on Instagram. Make sure you tag Dine Around Downtown at Home, Dine Downtown NYC, also China, also Chef Heigl, also me, and all of us will pick our favorite, and that person will win a 30-minute uh, cooking demonstration from Chef Heigl which is pretty cool. Uh, follow me on Facebook and Instagram at rockodespirito.com. Thank you, Shelly, for including that. I appreciate it. Uh, the 30 minute cooking classes have been very popular guys. And uh, I'll just say that if you make it really colorful and show us that you've made a little effort, we'll be happy to uh, make sure you win. Um, <laughs> Chef, thank you. Thank you very much for taking the time to set this up. Uh, we've got more coming guys. Malibu Farm on November 18th, the Bar Room on December 16th. Go to China Restaurant at 100 Maiden Lane. 
make this your new, make him your new bestie. Go in and say you, you saw him on IG Live, Downtown Alliance. I'm sure there'll be a little extra Mapu Tofu in there, in, in the bag for you. Uh, don't, don't forget to sign up for the next two, November 18th and November 16th. You have to sign up. Again, China's located at 100 Maiden Lane in Lower Manhattan. China's website for a 15% discount on your first order is www.chinachinah.kitchen. And you can follow them on Instagram at Eat China and on Facebook at, at China.us. This has been really fun, guys. It was a nice break, but I'm so glad you're back. I look forward to our next one. Thank you, everyone at the Downtown Alliance, Shelly Craig Ron, and all the other people who work so hard on making these shows happen. Thank you, Chef. Talk to you all soon. Love you guys.